Welcome everyone to Interactive Plotting with R. Um, I'm Annie Yu, I'll be leading the session. Um, my job title is Epidemiological Programmer. I work for Harvard County Council. I've been a member of the NHSR community for around a year, I think. I've done a few training sessions before. So I've done this one previously a few times and then um, the classic introduction to R, the very popular one. So it's nice to meet you all. Um, just to let you guys know that the session is being recorded. Um, it will be cleaned before it gets uploaded online. It might not be uploaded, um, uh, depends on how it goes, but just to let you guys know that it is being recorded at the moment. Um, if you're uncomfortable with going off mic and asking questions, feel free to drop questions in the chat either um, to everyone or just to me, it is up to you. But if you ever have any issues or ever have any questions, please do feel free to ask me or um, everybody else uh, anything regarding the code or any anything else uh, in this course. So um, let me know in the chat right now if you do not see my PowerPoint slides. Um, I think I am sharing at the moment, but if you do not see it on your Zoom screen, do let me know in the chat. Okay, thank you, Vanessa, for uh, saying, reassuring me that you can see it. And I've also got our Studio Cloud up. So you can do this training session in RStudio Cloud, which is through the link that should have been emailed to you, or you can do it in your local machine, um, provided that you do have the contents that were sent to you in the email. So you should have been linked a GitHub repo, um, this one called int plot training in my, um, under my name. So if you wanna do it in your local RStudio, then just download the zip folder or clone this repo, and you can also do this course um, outside of RStudio Cloud in your own RStudio. But for uh, this time, I will be using RStudio Cloud as well. Um, don't need to open it up just yet, but just to let you know that uh, these are the options available to you. Uh, the link to the RStudio Cloud, yep, I can resend that. So, so that should be an invite to the workspace on RStudio Cloud. And if you want my GitHub repo where you can download the course materials for yourself, I will also send that. Okay, cool. Um, let's start with the presentation. So the learning objectives today will be simple. We're going to learn what interactive plots are, when it's appropriate to use them over static ones, basic uses of the Plotly package and eCharts for R package, how to refer to JavaScript documentation to add extra functionality, and how to present your interactive plots in R Markdown documents or Shiny apps. The last one is basically going to be inferred in a way because you would have made so many plots that you could easily envision how to just put them in an R Markdown or Shiny app, because um, I assume that most of you are familiar with R Markdown, um, but there's also just an R Markdown uh, worksheet in the course materials for you to try out for yourself as well. So what are interactive plots? And once again, uh, just to remind you, if um, anything's wrong with my volume, if you can't hear me, if I'm going too fast or too slow, feel free to message me um, or just drop something in the chat. So interactive plots, um, I think most of you would be familiar with ggplot. So the ggplot2 package, uh, it makes really great visualizations, but they're static PNGs or JPEGs. Um, but interactive plots are different. They're kind of like widgets. So for example, if you hover over a part of the bar or a particular data point, there could be 
um, some tooltips or text that appears up. You'll be able to zoom in on the plot, zoom out. You'll be able to select and deselect parts of the legend. All of this will make sense once you start making your own plots. So it really lets the, uh, the viewer interact with the plot in a way that a simple PNG and JPEG does not allow you to do. So there are a couple of plot libraries that can do this. Um, we'll be going through two of them today. Uh, Plotly is by far the most popular uh, interactive plotting package available thus far for our users, uh, followed by a couple of others um, of kind of similar popularity like high charts and e-charts. Leaflet is for interactive mapping, Network D3 for network graphs, but we won't be going through those today because it will take too much time. Um, so on this slide, I've just shown you some examples of some interactive plots that you might've seen online on online dashboards or other kind of widgets or R markdowns. Uh, so essentially the most common thing that happens is you're able to click on them, be able to hover over, get more information of them, you'll be able to interact with them in some way. And it really provides uh, some useful utilities in that you can you know, get more data information out of it. Um, rather than just a static static image, like a GT plot. So when should you use interactive plots over a static plot, like a GG plot? plot? Um, so for example, I think they're usually very popular in dashboard type settings, or when you're building a tool uh, to showcase data that you want the user to be able to hover over for more detail. So for example, if you think about a typical bar plot on ggplot, um, you'll have the uh, y-axis with the numbers, but you can't exactly tell what value the bar plot is unless you label it. An interactive plot will let you hover over the, the, the bar and then you can see the exact value, 20% or something. Um, so it kind of allows you to showcase uh, more data that way. You can also hide things by default and show things. So for example, if you want to have like a default date range, let's say um, you only want plot to be filtered to the latest month of data, you can do that. And then the user will be able to kind of expand the x-axis to like show the entire year or something like that. Um, you can also have shared interactivity between several plots. So for example, if you click, if you deselect one portion of one plot, the same thing will happen to another plot that it's connected with. So you can have a lot of fun with faceted plots that way. And um, yeah, it, it's more engaging for the viewer if they're able to kind of like zoom in on stuff that they um, can see very clearly. You can, you know, you'll be able to do that with an interactive plot. And in general, they look very impressive. So uh, that is also, you know, the, the cosmetic side of it also matters sometimes. Sorry, I might stop sharing my camera because it's getting in the way of my monitor a little bit. Okay. Uh, there are also limitations using interactive plots that you should keep in mind of. So uh, you can say that interactive plots tend to be less customizable compared to ggplot2. They're still very much customizable. It's just that it, it's harder to customize, I would say. And uh, in general, I feel like the flexibility that you get with the ggplot package is probably unmatched. Um, so, um, you know, you'll, I at least find myself slightly struggling when I want to like make very, very specific cosmetic changes to a plot. Also probably more pretty important, uh, they take up more space. So if you have like an R markdown report with like a hundred interactive plots, it will be significantly um, bigger in size, the file. Um, and, you know, I found myself making previously the mistake of making a very, very huge R markdown file with a lot of interactive plots and then sending it by email. And then it just couldn't send because it would reach the limit, the, the space limit. So keep that in mind. And certain functionalities are hard to find in the original R documentation. I will explain this in more detail later, but basically it has to do with the fact that these packages are based on JavaScript documentation. So sometimes you have to go to the original JavaScript documentation and not the R documentation. 
Uh, also, their certain functionalities are a little bit buggy in R because, as I said, it's kind of translated into R from JavaScript. So not everything will work perfectly. And to be honest, not everything JavaScript works perfectly as well, from what I've heard. Um, and at times, it can confuse the viewer if there's too much functionality. So always keep that in mind when you're designing any kind of data visualization. So as an example, I think that this kind of data visualization um, does not need to be interactive. Like, you know, the point that you're trying to get across is quite clear with this, pic with this picture. Um, the, the numbers are already kind of clearly labeled. You're kind of getting already getting the message across. So I think that in this case, this plot doesn't need to be interactive. But, you know, if you think that there is a component that you want people to hover over to get more information of, then yes, uh, an interactive plot is probably uh, good to make. But, you know, just keep in mind to, to think about what you're using the, inter uh, the interactivity for. Okay, so just to re reiterate what I kind of said about JavaScript. Um, everything you can say is built from JavaScript if it's interactive. Um, if you're making an interactive plot, you're making a widget. So, uh, and those are all built on JavaScript. So take the most commonly used package that we'll be going through today, Plotly. The graphs produced using the Plotly package are powered by the JavaScript library plotly.js. Um, the functions in the package basically allows you to use JavaScript interface using R code. Because of this, you can't render an interactive plot in static documents like a PDF document or a Word document, but it will work if you have kind of, the easiest way to think about it is if you have like a browser-like um, element to it, like an HTML document from an R markdown, you open it up in a browser. Uh, a Shiny app open in the browser, your local R Studio plot viewer, that could be, you know, that's kind of a browser environment. So. Anything that can open a widget, uh, an interactive plot will work in it, but PDF, Word document will not. They will only accept static images. Keep that in mind. Um, and also if you have any experience with JavaScript or web development or maybe any type of you know, like coding, uh, a coding experience, uh, this all probably makes sense to you and you will probably uh, pick this up really quickly, maybe more quickly than me, to be honest. So this visualization I just kind of included here from the uh, plotly.com guidance, uh, it kind of summarizes what I described very well. So you have the standard plotly code in R, so this is R code. There's an internal uh, function called plotly build that then translates this into a, an R list. And it translates it into a, a list because that is kind of the, the closest in structure an R code can get to to a JSON object. So then it uses another internal uh, function called plately.json, then translate this R list object into a JSON object, which you can see here. You can see that the language has changed into um, JavaScript essentially. And then it renders this JavaScript object into an HTML chart in your web browser. Okay, um, any, any questions so far about the theory. Okay, swiftly moving on. So for this training, I've uh, made a coding sheet, which is like a worksheet and then an answer sheet for all parts of the training. So basically the session will be split into two parts. We'll be going through Plotly first, which as I said, is the most popular interactive plotting package. So of course we need to cover it, it's essential. Uh, and the second half, I'll introduce a second plotting package that I think is really good as well. Um, and then we'll kind of go through the different uh, functionalities uh, in both packages. So I, in my personal opinion, Plotly does some things really well, and then eCharts does some things really well. And just knowing that you have uh, you know, the the utilities in both packages, I think, could be useful if you're choosing uh, which package to use or whichever visualization that you are planning to do. So I will move to um, our Studio Cloud just to show you the course materials. 
So if you are using RStudio Cloud like me, once you get into the workspace, make sure that the name of your workspace is NHSR Interactive Plotting with R. The name might be cut off, but as long as this name is correct, you should be in the right place. And you probably won't see a full list of the projects that I do because I see the private ones. You'll probably only see either a blank page or just your own. Um, so to make a new project in RStudio Cloud, just click on this button saying new project and then go to new RStudio project and then it should uh, deploy a new session for you. It might take a, a minute or two for it to for it to fully load, but that should be how it works. So I've kind of already made mine in advance. And this is kind of like the standard RStudio interface that you're all probably familiar with. So just while that is loading, um, just let you know that once it stops loading, you should see in your file viewer all of these files. If you do not see these files, please send me a message um, because that is a problem. Uh, you'll need these for the, for the training. Um, so as I said, I split it into two parts, uh, Plotly and eCharts. For uh, each part, there is a designated folder. So for the first part, you'll be going into the Plotly folder and then you'll find an answer sheet and a coding sheet. I recommend that you go to the coding sheet and you follow along with what I teach and, and um, what I code on, on screen. So there will be blank spaces for you to follow along and code along with me. If at any point you get stuck or if I'm going too quickly or um, you, know, you just kind of forgot what codes to, um, to put, then there's an answer sheet that you can look at for all the answers. Essentially, I won't really be, um, I won't really be doing much else outside of the code available in the answer sheet. So we should be good. And uh, one one tip for you guys, if you want to quickly skip to a particular section of the answer sheet, is there's a kind of a table of contents button here on the side. It's like the kind of um, it's a very small button, but it's like right next to source here. And then you'll be able to skip to certain titles in here. So if you know like which title you're struggling with, say single bar plot, then you can find it here and then just skip directly to the answers. That makes sense. And then we'll do the same thing for eCharts. Just go to the eCharts folder and there'll be answer sheet and coding sheet as well. Okay, um, just give you guys a minute to fully kind of deploy sessions. I know that might take a while, but you don't need to install any packages because they've been pre-installed. So hopefully that should save you some time. Okay, back to the slides. So while that is going on for you guys, um, I'll just briefly mention ggplotly, which some of you might have heard of, um, because all it essentially does is it converts a ggplot object into a plotly object. So it's very convenient if you want to make a very quick interactive plot. Um, I don't recommend that you rely on this function, however, because you're going to make an interactive plot using plotly, then you should just use the plotly syntax to make a plotly plot. You shouldn't uh, rely on ggplotly to do it. You know what I mean? Because then you're kind of, you know, um, the code just isn't really that, um, it just, it's just not best practice to do that. But I will demonstrate really quickly how that works. So I'm just gonna go to the coding sheet for Plotly, run all these libraries, read in the data. So that's just uh, some publicly available case, uh, COVID case data. And then I'll run this part of the code that says GPOL example. So I'll just run these two and then you'll see how it produces an interactive plot, with the basic iris data set that 
we're very familiar with at this point, I think. So, you know, here we make a standard ggplot. And then using ggplotly, you convert it into a plotly object. And then, you know, you can click on the legend to kind of deselect, et cetera. So this is like quite, and then you have like a toolbar here that lets you like, you can zoom in and out, et cetera. So this is very standard uh, in interactive plot uh, functionality. But like I said, shouldn't rely on that. So we should learn how to do it properly using the, the poly package. So it, it probably works in a similar way to ggplot. It, the logic is all based on layers. Um, so you have a standard plotly uh, main call where you build on uh, what the x axis is, what the y axis is, what type it is, and then you can add on uh, additional layers to it. So if a bar plot, you can add on another line uh, layer, and then you can work on the aesthetics, such as the title, the labels, et cetera. And the main function call is plot underscore Lee. And then the first argument, as is per usual, is the data set. Then you got your X and your Y variables. Um, do you need to keep in mind that you need to add a squiggly line after the equals uh, operator? And then you can have additional arguments such as what type it is. The magnitude pipe will also work. Uh, and then, as I said before, you add on additional layers using add trace. And then the layout function is similar to uh, ggplot's theme. So, you know, you can add labels, titles, edit the, uh, the, the coordinates uh, of the legend. Uh, so center it, you could uh, do a bunch of cosmetic stuff using, using this function. Okay, so uh, enough looking at the code and let's actually try doing some coding. because so I find that that's the best way to learn, at least for me, is to actually just dive into coding and doing it. So um, if you haven't already, I encourage you to open your, your project and then go into the Plotly folder and then open the coding sheet. So you should have two files and then I, I encourage you to open the coding sheet, but you can also open the uh, answer sheet so that you, you have a fallback. And then please run uh, the library calls because you'll, be, uh, you'll be needing at least tidyverse and poly for sure. And then if you can also read in the cases data, so just run line 14. So that you have that in your environment. So if you want to see how the data set looks like, it's just it's just a simple data set over time by geography and with um, daily case numbers, uh, rolling some day average and case rate. Cool. So let's make a single line plot, which is probably the simplest plot that I can think of at the moment. So you're taking your cases data set and then you're filtering it to England. Uh, you're arranging it by date just because I'm uh, uh, paranoid that it will uh, arrange it in a weird way, but it might work without this line. And then you have your main plotly call. So you've already piped this data set in. Um, now I just need to assign the X variable, which should be date and then y variable which should be um let's see which new cases by published date so it's a bit of a long column name but yep and then because it's a line plot i i want to specify that it's a line plot so i'm going to say type equals Scatter because in Plotly they consider it uh, kind of a scatter plot but connected. So then you have to say that its its mode is lines. Oops. Okay, let's try running that. Oh, 
time let's see any cases oh did i miss something no oh should be case rate so that's a better example Okay, sorry. So on the on the y-axis, we're using case rates, not daily cases for now. So what that does is it makes a simple line plot where you hover over it, you can get exact value for the exact date. Uh, if you're curious how to make it actually just a scatter plot, then just remove mode equals lines. You'll just get a scatter plot. It will default to it. Or you can actually specify within modes that you just want the markers, I think it's called. Yeah, so they call that markers. And if you want both, then I think it's lines plus markers. Yeah, and then you'll see that they're connected. Okay, um, so I think that was pretty simple and um, quite easy to understand, especially if you've used ggplot before, you'll be familiar with um, you know, assigning the x and the y axes and then specifying the type, even though the, you know, the type names are a little bit different. So let's try a grouped line plot because I do have several area uh, geographies in here. Um, I included Harvardshire because you know, that's just uh, where I work. Um, but obviously, you know, to make it applicable for you, uh, you know, you could just imagine it as uh, your own geography of interest. But I'm just going to take the cases data set again, and I'm not going to filter the area to just England. Let's try doing plotly um, x equals date again, y equals case rate, and Type equals scatter, mode equals, let's do lines plus markers again. Oh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button on my keyboard. Um, and then, uh, and then you just add this new argument called color. So you're just saying that you're coloring by the area name. Uh, again, you need the squiggly line. Just remember that. And now you have a grouped line plot. Actually, I think it looks better without markers. I'm going to remove the markers for now. Yeah. Uh, and again, you can click on the legend to kind of deselect. And you can double click on. Uh, one of the groups to kind of isolate it. So if you double click on England real quick, you'll notice that it just isolates that one, which is quite useful. Um, if you have a lot of groups, you can you can just quickly like isolate on one, which is quite neat. And I think that is, uh, you know, uh, a utility that's unique to Plotly. It's not in eCharts. I kind of miss it whenever I use eCharts. Cool, so now that we know how to make a line plot, let's make uh, a bar plot instead. Um, I think those are two of the most widely used uh, plot types, right? So let's do plotly again. And you know, I'm just going to copy and paste the previous line because actually I'm gonna copy and paste the this one for the single line plot because we're doing a single bar plot, not a group bar plot. So I'm just gonna do that. And as you can probably guess, uh, all you're really changing is the type. You're changing the type scatter to type bar. And because type bar is, um, you know, it doesn't have any other modes, it's just bar, you don't need the mode argument. In fact, I don't know what would happen if I left the mode argument. I imagine it would error or it just completely, completely ignores it, I guess. So yeah, it doesn't need the mode argument. You just need type equals bar. And it produces this bar plot. Again, hover over, it's interactive. You can zoom in and stuff. Um, 
And just to go back to the slides, changing the bar, uh, the bar type is as simple as that, just changing the type into scatter, bar histogram, heat map, et cetera. There's loads of guidance online on how to do other types of graphs that we're probably not gonna go through today. Um, I'll, you know, because I, at least in my job, we only, we mainly use line plots, bar plots, and box plots sometimes. Those are the most common ones, but it's very easy to use the other ones as well. There are some more complex ones like, you know, tree maps and uh, sun diagrams, those kinds of Sankey diagrams. You can make them using Plotly for sure, but the code is like the format is slightly different. So do look that up if you're interested in making those more complicated types of graphs. Uh, but for day, for today, just for time, we're just going to stick with the basic ones. Okay, um, and you know, as usual, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat or interrupt me. Um, please, like, don't um, hesitate to interrupt me if you have any questions. Cool. So hopefully that seemed easy enough. Um, now let's actually try to do what I said before, which is actually adding on the layers. So let's say that you have this bar plot that we just made, but you want to add a, a line layer on top so that um, you know you might want to plot the daily uh, the daily case numbers and also have a rolling weekly average on top. So these kinds of visualizations were very popular during the, the height of the pandemic. So what we can do is copy the previous code because I'm lazy and I don't want to rewrite stuff. Um, I'm going to change the Y to new cases by publish date. That is actually an awful long colon name. I need to change that next time. Just double check that I've written it correctly. New cases by publish date. Okay, let me run this to make sure that it works. Yep, that's fine. And then I'm just going to add a pipe and I'm going to use the add trace function that we saw before. And I will add another uh, another column's data. So rolling average is called. So y equals rolling abg. And I will specify that I want the type to be scatter. And that the mode is lines. If I run that, you'll see that it's done what we expect it to. It has added an additional layer um, of the, the rolling average as a line layer. So you'll notice that uh, it has added a legend on the side by default. So obviously you can always remove the legend, but in this case, I'm opting to keep it, but the names are a little bit awkward. So to actually clean this up a little bit, I'm going to specify that I want the name of the first layer to be daily cases as an example, and then the name of the second layer to be rolling average. And if I rerun that, you'll see that the legend now makes a lot more sense and interpretable. Right, and you'll notice that uh, when you hover over the line, it gives different values compared to the, to the bar. So it, it shows you the value by the uh, area that you hover, which makes a lot of sense. I don't know why I'm describing that. Um, I will also introduce you a, a different way to do this code, okay? So if you're like me and you want to be just a little bit more organized just because you can, there is a way to be more specific about the layer that you're adding. So if, so let me just preface this by saying that add trace is a great function, um, but it is a generic function. So it essentially what it means, trace just means layer, but you can specify add bars. And when you use add bars instead of add trace, you can actually remove, oh, sorry, it shouldn't be add bars, it should be add lines. We're adding a line layer, yes. You can actually remove the type and the mode because add lines is specific to line layers. If I rerun this, it should produce the exact same result. If you want to be uh, even more specific, you can actually make the original plotly call just the, the metadata, if you will, of the plot, and then have the bar plot as the like the, the first layer and then the lines as a second layer. So let me just demonstrate this, okay? So if I end the first layer there and then I do an add bars, again, now I don't need to specify. 
I also type R, so add bars is specific to bars. I'm just going to keep the name equals daily cases. And if I rerun this, it should produce the same result once again. Well, this, and you know, I feel you can do this in ggplot as well. So in ggplot, you can also just have like the default settings in the original call and then add additional layers like, you know, geom bars, uh, geom point. So this kind of mimics uh, that, exact, that exact same logic. Um, it is completely up to you which one you decide to use. Um, this one gives a little bit of information when you see it. So a colleague might easily know what you're doing. But at the same time, you know, you got type equals bar. So it's quite obvious that you're making a bar plot. So really, it, you know, it, it's really up to you how you organize your code. Just introducing this as an alternative. But yes, uh, add, add trace is very powerful because it adds essentially anything. Okay, um, hopefully I'm not going too quickly. If I am, do let me know. But once again, you do have the very handy answer sheet that you can use if you ever get stuck. And I think I do include that example in the, in the answer sheet. Maybe not the add bars part, but I think it's like quite obvious uh, how that works at this point. Cool, so now that we've kind of gone through you know, uh, changing the geometry of, of, the, of the plot, adding layers, which are, you know, quite essential bits of uh, information, we can talk a little bit more about customizing the plot. So adding titles, centering the legend, uh, maybe some fancy stuff like changing the, uh, uh, changing the color and um, modifying how the, how the, how the hovering, hovering text works. So, uh, let's see, let's see what is first. Okay, so you've got adding the title and changing the tooltip first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to copy and paste the previous code again. Just don't feel like rewriting all that. And then use the layout function to change uh, all of those things that I just mentioned. So title should be pretty straightforward. I think it was just title equals, I can type title equals um, cases in England. And you'll see that it's added a title, simple as that. Uh, tool tip, right. So let me just remind myself what that argument was called. Right, it was called hover mode, okay. So this is quite, um, I find this quite useful. So if you just try and follow along, hover mode equals X unified, it will make sense once you ran the code. So what this X uh, unified does is now you'll notice that whenever you hover over any point on the X axis, which is the date, you will see the values for both layers, right? So what this does is it, it kind of assumes that it doesn't like matter uh, on the uh, Y axis plane where the cursor is. It just cares about the X, uh, the location on the X axis. So it just presents all the values in every single layer uh, for that particular uh, X, um, X placement. Uh, which is very useful if you've got a lot of layers on top of each other and you don't want the viewer to bother hovering over specific layers. It just kind of presents it all to you. And I find that, you know, usually for most of my plots, I would do this X unified hover mode. So I find this very useful. Right, and what about the legend? Uh, it is quite annoying to me to have a legend on the side like this because there's a lot of negative space, at least right now. The legend does not need all that space. So what we can do to change that is again, use the uh, layout function and just add um, something within the legend argument, I think. So I think for the specific one, because the legend argument accepts several arguments, you will need to open up a list within it. And this is kind of um, this is kind of strange to me when I first learned it at first because as an R user you're kind of used to having one value per argument or at least a vector per argument. Um, 
But what happens in a lot of times in interactive plots is because of like the kind of original JavaScript doc, uh, code uh, that it was built in, um, an argument will accept a, a list of arguments or several arguments. And the way to do that with an R is you have to open up a list to do that. So then within this list, there are uh, several arguments that you can put in. Uh, let me remind myself what they are. Okay, so in this slide, I provided orientation equals H to make it horizontal, X anchor to be in the center, and then for the X placement to be 0 0.5, so right in the middle. So let's go through, uh, through sorry, I can't speak today, uh, go through these step-by-step step to see how much of a difference it makes for each one. Okay, so let's start with orientation equals y, uh, sorry, h for horizontal. So let's run that, see what happens. So once you do orientation equals h, Polly's is like, okay, you want it to be on the horizontal plane, we're gonna move it right down here because there's space. But what if you want to put it in the middle? Then you need to say, well, I want it to be on the x-axis location, I want it to be 0 0.5, which is right in the middle. But then after you do that, you'll notice that it has done that, you know, it technically starts from the middle, but it's not centered. And in order to center it at 0 0.5 on the x-axis, you will use another argument called x anchor and specify that you want it centered. And then once you do that, it will actually be properly centered. So this is the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, originally you're like, oh, this is like really simple. And then you try out one argument, but then you keep on finding that you need to just be very, very specific about particular things. And I guess this is what I mean when I say that ggplot in some ways feels simpler. So let me just go through uh, add trace again, because um, just got a question in chat uh, to go through that again. So add trace just adds a layer. In plotly terms, a trace is a layer. So that's like a geom point or a geom bar in ggplot terms, right? If you want to be more specific about the type of layer that you're adding, you can specify add bars or add lines. When you say add bars or add lines, you don't need to specify the type or the mode. So it's kind of a way to write a little bit less, be a little bit more organized with your code, but you don't really need to do it because again, add trace will just, um, it's kind of like a generic add layer, right? Um, so obviously, actually, let me just give a third example to this if it will help get the point across. So let's say I have the uh, default function call here. I can say add trace bar and then add trace scatter. And you know this again will create the same plot that we did previously because as long as you have an add trace and then you specify the type of the layer that you're making, it will create a new layer. That makes sense. Um, but yes, um, because you have the answer sheet, you can go back and kind of play around with the code um, at your own pace for this. It's, um, I think it's like one of those things, like once you get it, you know, you'll, um, you'll find that it's you know quite intuitive. But at the start, it did take me a while as well to kind of grasp how to how to do it. Um, got another question in the chat about X unified. So um, X unified is a specific hover mode that actually isn't the default. I think the default is an item, so it goes by item, not by X unified, um, which is why I had to specify X unified to get it to work that way. So if I remove the hover mode right now for this particular plot, it'll go back to like, whenever you hover over the item, then you'll get one value. See what I mean? 
which is kind of annoying because I would prefer if the hover mode was X unified by default. But yes, I have to specify it every time because I find that X unified is the superior way of having your plot most of the time. I honestly forgot what the other term was. There, there was another hover mode, the, ho the hover mode for the default, which is like by item. But because it is the default, I find that I don't need to specify it. So I, I've forgotten what it was called. I only remember X unified. But I'm sure if you go online and look for it, you'll find it. Okay, um, right. Uh, I think that's all the questions that I had. Um, and finally, I'll go through. So I'll skip modifying hover text. If you want to, um, so I'll quickly run the code in the answer sheet for that, but I don't think it's that important. So I will just show you what that does. And then I'll, I'll let you um, go through that on your own time if you want to, but I find that it's not like really a very important thing to go through right now. So what this code does in the answer sheet, and you know, you don't need to like write it or anything. I'm, I'm specifically skipping it to save time. What it does is it kind of uh, modifies the template of your hover text. So you'll notice that now I've got a bold text that I've like written on it. <clears throat> And this is like if you want to like really customize the text that appears on hover and kind of organize it if you don't like how Plotly does it by default. I find that I don't use it most of the time, but you know, some, some people might find it useful. Um, and you do that by specifying the hover template here. So this is kind of like an R mar uh, a markdown language. Um, and you know, you can specify the positioning of your Y value here, your X value here and then the reason why it shows a bold upon hover is because you can use html within this so i just use the the bold html tag to bold the word positive and then it shows up on bold so yes again on your own time you can look through this code but i'm deciding to skip it because i don't find that it's useful most of the time for me uh, what i find more useful is changing colors so let's say that you are not happy with the default colors of Plotly. Um, you don't like the orange or you don't like the blue, or you want to use organizational colors, which is very understandable because we do that as well uh, in my workplace. So if I go back to the slide, uh, I go through that here. Um, all you need to do is specify on the layer that you want to change the color to, marker equals a specific color. And then you can do that again for another layer. So let me do that in the actual code because I'm sure that it's much easier that way. So let's say that I want to change the line layer specifically. Let me do marker equals list. Oh, actually, this is an interesting one because I know that this will error. So let me do the bars first, actually, because that one is less prone to error. So the first layer, let me let me say, uh, let's say that we want to change the bars to red. We we'll say marker equals list. Again, we open the list because marker accepts several arguments. List equals color, and I'm just going to say red. Obviously, you can feed in a specific shade through some kind of uh, hash code, um, but I'm just lazy and I just specified red. And you'll see that it did change the color of both the bars and the markers in the next layer. Because if you might remember from previously, um, the markers are the, the data points in the scatter plot, and then the lines are kind of like an independent element of it. So you'll notice if you squint really, uh, really well um, that the lines are actually still orange, but everything else, the markers are all red. So to kind of supplement this, I will, I will specify in the second layer that I, I don't want it to be red. I, I want it to be blue, for example. If I do that, then the, the markers will change the color. Um, but obviously, right now, we don't really want the marker. We don't really care about the marker color. We care about the line color. So what I'm going to do is I am going to change the marker argument into line because that is the element 
that we're working with. And if I run this, it will actually change the line color. Annoyingly, it will still have the, the red marker, um, which, is, uh, which, which is really annoying. So let me remove the red. And now we have like, I guess like originally my example was to just color the lines, but I kind of uh, derailed it and tried to color the bars as well. Um, yeah, so originally I just wanted to kind of color the color the bars. Um, off the top of my head, I don't quite remember how you can prevent the bar layer from coloring the uh, the line layer. I think um, I think during the break I I can look into that if you're interested. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's some argument that just specifies do not show, uh, do not show the markers. But I'll tell my head, I, I don't quite remember. Um, yeah, I, I will, I will look into this. It, it's kind of like, like I said, Plotly is like annoying sometimes when you want to be really specific, which is why I do, I do think that ggplot is, uh, superior in that regard. Uh, so moving on from that, next part is editing the mode bar. Um, I'm not sure if people find this too useful either. So in case you're wondering, what I mean by mode bar is this toolbar that appears at the top right here. So what I personally find is that a lot of these buttons aren't really that useful to me. So if you want, you can remove some of these buttons. So for example, like the loss of select is just like a mess of a tool in my opinion. Um, I don't see why anybody would use it to be honest. And the box select is kind of redundant because you don't really need to select it because uh, you can just kind of select it as like by default. A lot of these, I just find that I don't really need them. So if you want to remove them, um, there is this there is this function called oh I didn't didn't specify it uh, it's quite a long function so I need to remind myself what the name is right mode bar buttons to remove um, so if you want to change that let me copy and paste the code again you will need the specific function called config and then within config Sorry, let me. Copy and paste that function because hard name to remember and then within this you just feed in a vector of the buttons that you want to remove. If you want to know the specific names of these buttons you're going to have to refer to this web page that I linked in the script here. Um, if my internet is fast enough. So what you'll find is it'll be directed to a, uh, a script completely in JavaScript and the names of the buttons will follow after mode bar buttons dot, right? Um, so these are the names called zoom 2D, pan 2D, select 2D. Um, I could I could have compiled this into a a better uh, more compact list, but honestly, I think that it's you know not not a bad idea to just kind of refer to the original documentation sometimes. But let's say that like the lasso two D, I definitely don't want to keep. So I know that it's called lasso two D from the original script. So I'm just going to say I want to remove lasso two D, and if I run that, it should remove that button from the top. Um, seems to have errored actually. I don't know. Oh, it's because I don't need to see. Perhaps I need to feed it at least two. Let me try putting in another one. Zoom 2D. Okay, so now it works. Okay, well, that is, I feel like that is a bug that needs to be fixed. Um, apparently you can only remove two, 
for uh, using this function, um, at least two. I can't remove just one. But yeah, now you can see that the toolbar is slightly smaller. I've removed Lasso 2D and the zoom bar. Yeah. Okay. It is quite, it is a bit strange that I can't remove just one. But maybe there is a reason. Yeah, there's a, and I'm sure there's also a, a function to completely remove this if you want to. Um, it's probably just a quick Google search. So remove mode bar and slapper. Yeah, so this page, okay. So display mode bar equals false. Let's try that. Display mode bar. So now that's completely removed it. So there are these um, functions that allow you to customize the mode bar as well. Um, you saw how easily I managed to Google it up. So don't think we need to spend more time on this particularly. Um, cool. Any questions before we get to the exercise? Oh, thank you, David. Um, list lasso 2D. Oh, that's a good point, isn't it? If it's a list, maybe it's because it's closer to the structure of the JavaScript. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that did it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Really nice catch. Okay, um, I'm seeing no questions. So let's go directly to the first exercise. I think it'd be pretty easy if you've been following along. So if you can use the data set given to you, the case data set, um, can you try making a bar plot showing the daily COVID cases over time in England with an additional line layer showing the rolling seven day average over time? Name both of the layers so that the legend would make sense and add a title. And if you want for a bonus additional challenge, you can try changing the line color to a different shade of blue. Um, you don't need to change it to the specific one. You can change it to just any color that you want and change the hover mode to X unified and move the legend to the bottom. So basically all the things, all the steps that we did before, but just mushed together. Um, I put on some hints here in case you need it. Um, Honestly, I think it's pretty straightforward if you just refer to the code that we've done previously. So if I can give you guys, um, let's do, I think seven minutes should be enough, right? Let's do seven minutes. Um, and then we'll come back, go through the answers and then have a, a tea break. How does that sound? Cool. I'm hearing no objections, so I will now mute myself and start the timer for seven minutes. Good luck.
Okay, I think it's been seven minutes. Um, hopefully you guys have gone on all right. Um, otherwise I can just uh, go on and show you the answers. And, oh, actually before that, I just noticed a question that I missed from Neil. Can you do a facet rep cell chart in Plotly? Technically, yes, but it's really overcomplicated in my opinion. So faceting is probably one of the things that Plotly is um, very weak in. I think that the other package that we're gonna go through is a little bit better when it comes to faceted plots. Uh, I will show you a live example on how it looks. Uh, and Plotly, I'm not sure if I should because honestly, they're kind of clunky to work with. Uh, they're called subplots. So if I, uh, if I can find the right monitor and just quickly Google that to show you how that looks like. So essentially you do have to make the plots and then you join them together. And that's as close as you'll get to a, a faceted plot in Plotly. Um, last I checked anyway, maybe they had some kind of update and improve this, but you know, I when I had to do a facet plot using Plotly, uh, I had to resort to subplots. So I essentially created a loop that made all of my figures and then I joined them together using the subplot function. Um, yes, so it's a little bit of a hassle. ggplot has a lot of strengths. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, also I'm happy to report to you guys that I figured out how to just change the marker color for the bars and for it to not affect the line plots like we saw before. Um, I will just send the code in the chat for you guys. Um, I don't think I should spend too much time going over it because it, I think it'll make a lot of sense once you see it. Essentially, um, the more organized you are with your code, uh, the less likely you will get errors like the one that you just saw while I was trying to demonstrate uh, how to change the colors. So if you actually specify the add bars properly, and then you say that the marker is color red, and you specify the second one is a line trace, specify that the line is blue, then you will not get that kind of uh, weird uh, bleeding of the of the color into the, the different layers. So I guess lesson, uh, lesson there is um, if you want to be very specific with the colors for each layer, then also be very clean with the way that you code different traces. Okay. But I'm, uh, I'm glad that, that uh, we found a solution to this. Okay, so let's move on to exercise one. So let's, let me, let me see again what it wants. Bar plot, uh, some day average, legend, Okay, cool. So we take cases, filter the area name to England. Plotly x is date as always. Y is, oh, let me just double check that I'm not muted. Okay, cool. New cases by publish date. And type equals R. So now it's called new cases by publish date. Should be how it's spelled. Okay, and then add, I'll just specific say add lines, y equals rolling average. Specify the names, so Daily cases. Uh, 
selling average. And then I think there were some extra ones that we could do with the layout. So title, what did it say? Yes. Okay, any title that I want. Um, like that. And I think cover mode as well was one of the bonus steps. And the legend was honestly, you know, could have just copy and pasted this, but I happen to remember it since fairly recent. Same critical center, uh, X equals 0 0.5. Like that. I think I could also do something like, um, I mean, let me just see if this, uh, this works. Okay, that works. So um, what I did was just a little bit extra because I was annoyed that the, the date label at the bottom was uh, showing up. So I just specified that the X axis title is, is blank. So that, that's all I did. And I think that is the gist of the exercise. I guess you could also change the line color. Yes, so let me do that as well. Yep. And that should be the uh, exercise, including the bonus steps. Got a question in the chat. Um, how can we specify different numbers of days for the rolling average? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by different numbers of days? Is that more uh, something that you need to change in the data or in the plot? Oh, um, I suppose that, that sounds like something that you should change in the data set and not in the plot. So whether it's like a 14 day rolling average instead of a seven day rolling average. Because uh, I, I pre-processed this data set. Um, so it sounds like that's something that should go into the the, the pre-processing processing of that. Uh, we don't really process the data in the in the plotting code. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. So like I'm just all I'm doing is I'm feeding these values into the plot. I guess what you could do to make it more specific is uh, you know change the um, the the hover text, which I. Uh, which I skipped, but you know, it could be something that you could add in there to like make it more specific whenever they hover over the text. Um, although you could also just do that in the in the layer name. But yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think um, any further questions before we go into our break? Would it be possible to add a second y-axis for the rolling average? Um, possibly not best practice to do that, but I know that you can in Plotly. Um, uh, I, I assume that it would be adding it to the right side of the plot. So I think there were some examples in the, in the Plotly documentation, if I can just find that. Yeah, so you can't add multiple axes. I personally have not done this that often, but it essentially looks like this. I'm imagining that this is what you're what you're asking about, right? So um, yeah, not too much experience doing this, but apparently you need to involve both the uh, you know the the initial uh, trace function and the layout function in order to do this. But yeah, the, the poly documentation has um, does go through this in quite a lot of detail if you do if you do want to do that. And uh, it, you can also do this within subplots as well. 
Any other questions? Okay, in that case, let's go for a 10 minute break. So we can come back at half past 11. That sounds good to you guys. Um, we're aiming to finish at 1230, but I will try to go through most of the content within the first 30 minutes after we come back. And then the, uh, the, the last 30 minutes could be just like bonus content of snazzy things that you can do. Sounds like a plan? All right. Um, I will mute myself and I'll see you guys in 10 minutes.
Hello, is everyone back? Um, if you are, can you give a thumbs up? I think there's a button to give a thumbs up or something in Zoom. Getting quite a few thumbs up. Thank you guys. All right, that felt more than, felt like a decent proportion, at least more than half, which is good. Um, cool, that's great, because I think the second half of the session is possibly a bit more interesting. Uh, depends on what you want from your plots, I guess, so. And for those that are leaving at 12, um, I will just give a summary as to what you'll be missing in the last 30 minutes, but you know, um, uh, you do have all the code available to you. So you can go, you can go through it at your own time. Um, I'm just going to briefly go through this uh, utility of adding buttons and drop down menus to your plots. So this is probably one of the most useful functionalities of Plotly Plot is that you can add buttons to actually change the data structure or the data content of your plot, which as you can imagine is very, very useful especially if you can't if you um, can't make a shiny app that has this kind of like drop down menu selection type of functionality if you don't have like a server to host your shiny app on and you need to make a kind of like a dashboard thing in an R markdown document or you just want your plot to have the ability to be able to change depending on like a, a button or something you can do that with plotly so I've done this before several times, and it's quite easy to do once you have the, the code to do it. Once you have the code to do it, which is in your answer sheet, um, all you need to do is kind of like modify the, the data. And, you know, at that point, you know, you, you can just copy and paste the same, the same code over and over, and it should work. Um, so I will just briefly explain the logic behind it. I'm not going to make you guys type it all out because the, the code is a little bit complex. And I obviously can't really um, quote it from scratch just off the top of my head either. I need to, to look at it as well. But um, I, I can explain it to you how it actually works. So I'm actually just going to go to the answer sheet and kind of show you exactly what it does. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the basically the last bit of the answer sheet. I'm going to run both chunks of code and I will show you what the result is like. Right, so you'll see that there's now a drop down menu that lets you select uh, England or hearts. And depending on which one you choose, you'll see that the data changes. Most noticeably, if you look at the Y axis, you'll notice that the, you know, the numbers are obviously smaller for Hertfordshire because Hertfordshire is a smaller geography. So the case numbers are going to be lower. So this is proof that you know it's it's worked. You're successfully filtering the data of the plot based off of buttons or drop down menu. Uh, this is obviously very useful. And before you, uh, so some people have also asked if you can put two drop down menus or several set of buttons in one plot. My answer is yes, you can do that. But um, again, I encourage you to think about whether it's worth putting so many uh, drop down menus and selections in one plot and whether you should like separate it into two plots at that point. Um, but again, everybody's needs are different. So I'm just here to tell you that yes, it is possible to put several drop down menus in your plot. Now, let me show you uh, just the code behind it, okay? So I actually have a previous example of this where it's just buttons and not a drop down menu. I will run that just to show you how that looks as well. So this is just the buttons by themselves. You'll notice that, that this, uh, example does something different in that instead of changing the data, it changes the uh, geometry of the plot. So it changes from a, a bar plot to a line plot, which um, could be useful in some cases, but I'm just going to go with the second example because I think that's what most people would be interested in is actually changing the data behind the visualization. So what you're doing first is you're going to make a list composed of button objects. So you'll notice that you, you open a list again, and then within this list, you have two additional lists. 
So I think it's fair to say that uh, whenever you are doing complex things with a interactive plotting package like Plotly, you are going to have to mimic the structure of the JavaScript language <clears throat> or syntax rather. Um, and, and to do this, you need to open up lists and then lists within lists, because um, if you're familiar with how JavaScript looks like it, you know, that is the closest that you can get. Um, and then within each list, you are kind of specifying, you're kind of like making the button, if you can think about it that way. So you're saying that the method is restyle and there are three methods, but I will say that the most used method is restyle. So that is the one that I've I really bothered uh, learning. Um, so restyle, essentially, if I refer back to the slide, restyle will modify the data or the data attributes. Relayout will modify the layout attributes. So that's mostly cosmetics, um, which um, I, I feel like it's not as important to modify in your plot using a, a button for. So, And then update, um, which I've actually never used or seen much examples of is to modify both the data and the layout attributes, which if you think about it is really not necessary if you just use restyle most of the time. Okay, so um, in both examples, I've used restyle because you are modifying the, the data. And the easiest way to think of it is if you're modifying this part of your function call. If you're modifying the layout, so that's this portion of your code, then you have to use relayout method. But most of the time, what we're concerned with is in here, right? Um, which in case means that we're using the resell method. And then within this, you are saying that you want to change the argument of, a, of the transforms value argument. And that if you press the button, so for this button, if you press it, you want to change it to the England value. And for the second button, you want to change it to Hertfordshire value. So you're making two of them because you have two options in the dropdown list. And then the label is simply like what is presented, right? So if I change this to um, button one, and this one to button two, as simple as, as that, and you'll see that the, the label changes to button one versus button two. And you know if I change this value to another geography, such as East of England, Let's try that actually. Change this piece of England. And I rerun both chunks of code. I select button two. You'll see that the values are uh, a bit higher than before. That's because East of England is a bigger geography than Hertfordshire. So that's successfully done it. Okay, let me just go back to Hertfordshire and the proper labels. So I think uh, that makes sense, right? So here you're just making the buttons and you'll notice that after you run this first chunk of code, the button list code, um, there'll be a new object in your environment called button list. So if you just open this button list object, you'll see that it's got two core elements, one and two, they're unnamed. But um, if you expand them, you'll see that it's, it's just whatever that you just coded in, method equals resale, Arguments, if you further collapse that, you'll see that it's just got everything that you just done. So then this object is being fed into the plotly call, uh, sorry, into the, the layout call. So um, within layout, there's a further uh, argument called update menus, which you have to open a list for. And then within that list, you can specify that you want it to be a drop down menu. The active zero just means that you want the first option to be England. So um, because Plotly uses JavaScript, JavaScript as a language uh, uses zero as its uh, um, as a starting point. So it counts from zero, one, two, three, whereas in R it's one, two, three, four, et cetera. So that is what that is. So if I actually say that active is one, it will actually start from Hertfordshire first as a default, okay? Uh, and then uh, when it specifies buttons, you just need to feed in the button list that you just made. Okay. And then uh, I would say the most complex part is within here. So there is a transforms argument that you can put in. And uh, you'll notice that this is not in the first example because the first example is less complex. The second example is more complex because you're kind of creating this uh, argument 
um, out of nowhere. Well, not out of nowhere because uh, JavaScript documentation will accept it, but you're kind of making it because um, this, this transforms value does not really exist and you're kind of making it once again using lists. Uh, again, kind of hard to explain this, but hopefully um, because you have the code, you'll be able to kind of modify it for your own needs. So you don't really need to change the type. All you need to remember is the target is the column that you are changing the buttons from. So if, for example, I want to, I want the button to change based off of the area, the area type column instead of area name, you'll just change it here. And then obviously you'll need to modify the values in here so that they correspond to the area type column instead. Um, but you know, like all that is like pretty, pretty simple to do. And then you don't need to change this. The operate operator should be equals by default. And then uh what you're doing here is you're saying that the value is going to um, vary between England and Hertfordshire. So within this vector, if you had like, if we had a third button called East of England, then you would add East of England in here. Um, uh, assuming that, you know, you have a, a third button in here for East of England, which, you know, is just copy and pasting this, changing this to East of England, uh, changing the label. Yo e like that. Uh, I'll change this act one back to zero. If I run that, there should be a third option in my drop down menu. And you can see that that has worked. So this is how you can uh, use this kind of as a starting point to to start um, adding drop down menus or buttons to your own polygraphs. And hopefully, um, Hopefully some of you may find that useful. I realize that I might be butchering the explanation by a lot, um, but uh, it is something that, um, you know, I wasn't really taught either. I just kind of found it and I tried to make sense of it. And, uh, you know, over time I've, 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 you know, made use of it quite a lot. Uh, in case you're wondering how to add two drop-down menus to it, it's as simple as making two button lists and then making two transforms, each with according to you know like the different set of buttons that you're that you're trying to add. Um, and then you know you also need to um, remember to update uh, update menus will not just have one list, but it'll have two lists within the list. Uh, and the additional thing that you need to remember, I suppose, is that instead of transforms zero value, it will be transforms one value if you do have two sets of button lists. So if we have time at the end of the session, and, and, and if we have time, I can go through an example if you guys want me to, to add two sets of drop down menus. Um, if you find that helpful, let me know in the chat, um, either privately or publicly. But we can go through that if we have time, or you can like stay afterwards and I can like kind of show you an example if you do want to. Uh, see that, but for now, I think I'll be moving on from this. Um, obviously, you do have the code, so you can try this out in yourself and see how it works and just make use of it if you find it useful. Uh, any questions about, about uh, adding buttons or drop down menus? Okay, cool. I think we're happy to move on. And you know, just to remind just to remind you guys um, how the the JSON object code looks like. So as you can see, this is quite similar to the, the list structure that we've just gone through. So that is kind of kind of what's going on. It makes the translation much easier. And also like I feel like the translation will not work if you did not use lists. So probably the reasoning behind it. Okay, let's move on to the core topic of the of the second bit of the session, which is eCharts, a completely different interactive plotting package, separate from Plotly. It is less popular, but I do think that it does certain things better. Uh, certain things Plotly does better, and certain things eCharts does better. It's just you know depending on what you use a chart for, um, you can decide which package to use. 
So one of the uh, great things about eCharts I find is that the syntax is very, very simple. It's very quick to pick up, especially if you're a beginner in R, I find that it's very beginner friendly. So just from this, uh, this chunk of script here, I think you can imagine what it's doing. So you're taking a data frame and then you are uh, making the core layer each using the eCharts function. And then you're adding a line layer, a bar layer, you're modifying the title, you're modifying the legend, tooltip theme, et cetera. And so it's quite, it's quite clear what it's doing. So let's go to the eCharts coding sheet. So if you go back to the main project folder and go to the eCharts folder this time, and then open the coding sheet there. So same process, you also have an answer sheet available to you if you need to refer to that. And if you can just run the library calls just in case and um, cases data again, and then a new data set, data set called NH. So it's uh, fake data that I made um, around mental health treatment data. I think it's broken down by uh, sex. Yeah, so it's got male and female. And then it's, uh, it's also by date and it's got some things like the mean, standard deviation, upper and lower compass interval. So that's what that is. Completely fake data. So, you know, like don't take any findings seriously. Okay. Uh, assuming that you've ran all this code, we can, we can begin making a single line plot again. So let's just, uh, you know, kind of compare how easy it is compared to Plotly. And, um, you know, it might not seem, as easy as, as probably, it's subjective, but I personally find that it's easier. So we start with cases, we filter the uh, area name to England and then uh, X axis is date. And then we just say E line. And let's say I want to plot the case rate. And it's done that. I think that was pretty easy. Uh, and you'll notice that in general, the eCharts uh, visualization looks different. It's got a different default color scheme and animation and all that uh, visuals are a little bit different. So let's move straight on to a grouped bar plot or a grouped line plot. I, miss, I must have mistyped that. It must be a grouped line plot. So I'm going to use the cases data set again. I'm going to do each chart, state, E-line, uh, case rate. And to group, um, to group within each charts, all you need to do is have a group by beforehand. So I'm grouping by area name. And I'm typing that into the each charts. So if I run that, you'll see that it's, presenting a grouped line plot. Uh, in my opinion, that was quite easy. Um, pretty, pretty simple logic there. Uh, okay, let's add layers on top of this now. So if I copy and paste this code and then add on a bar layer. So maybe I shouldn't do the group by. Should just be England, otherwise it will look weird. So filter England, e chart state, and then I'll add an E bar layer based off of new cases by published state. Uh, and actually it should be rolling average because the case rate is tiny, so changing E line to rolling average. And now this plot makes much more sense. Right, I think that was quite simple. Um, now, if you've been uh, hovering over this E charts plot, you'll notice that it's different in that it doesn't have the, the tooltips set on by default. So Again, because eCharts is a different package. It has different preset settings, got different functions. Um, so 
if you want the tooltip to appear, you'll need to turn it on. So let's try adding a bunch of stuff all at once related to cosmetics, like the title, tooltip, and the legend. So I'm just going to copy and paste the lot code that I had before. And I'm going to add on e title, super simple. Do that, add the title, no surprise there. Add on uh, using the additional function e tooltip. And uh, the trigger is between item or axis. So we want the trigger to be on the axis, which is the equivalent of X unified. I do that, then you'll see that once you hover over the X axis, you'll, you'll have the same thing that you did before with poly, except in my opinion, it's a little bit cleaner just because it's a different package and it's got different presets, different visuals. Um, if you're curious on what the other one is, it's called item. So item is essentially you'll have to hover over the exact layer data point to see the value. So usually I would, I would just do access. Um, and then e legend is the function that you would use to modify the legend. So for example, you can change the type to scroll, which in this case doesn't really do anything because the, the legend is not long enough for that. So I think I'll just showcase this function by saying show equals false. So that would just kind of hide the, the legend from appearing. But essentially like most things that you would do to modify the legend, you would do it within this function. Um, sound has gone. Oh, is anybody uh, else having sound issues? Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't change any settings on my end, so I'm not sure. Is it still gone for you? Oh, brilliant. All right, great. Cool. So yes, um, what else can we do to showcase uh, e-charts? Um, I think that's most of what we did in Plotly. We did move the uh, the legend around a little bit, but I think that's, I think I will kind of cover that in the next part of this, uh, the, the next slide. So just to show you guys the slide, um, eCharts has a bunch of default functions for uh, not just geometries, but also kind of elements of the plot. So, you know, the legend, the title, the x-axis, y-axis, tooltip, error bar, and the theme, which is a really cool thing that I, I'm excited to show you guys in like a bit. So let me uh, go through the JavaScript documentation, which I think is quite a useful skill. Um, if you are leaving early, uh, I advise you to just kind of like uh, listen to these last five minutes about how to use a JavaScript documentation, because I think it will save your life if you're trying to uh, use interactive plots quite often like me. So you might remember all the, the lists that I was talking about, how you had to like open a list, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how you need to uh, you know use these additional arguments within lists. Now, obviously uh, the question then is, where are you going to find all of these arguments, right? Um, so the answer is obviously the documentation, but I would actually advise you to not refer to the R documentation. I would advise you to refer to the JavaScript documentation. Um, and a lot of people at first, they're kind of hesitant to do that because it's a different language. It feels very unfamiliar, but once you get through the fear of that and just uh, see that it's something scary, it, um, you know, I regularly refer to JavaScript documentation when I do R code, I don't do JavaScript. I'm my work is completely in R, but I refer to these documentations quite regularly, I would say. So um, provided that you can see my browser, hopefully, um, this is the JavaScript documentation for the eCharts package that we have just used. And I find that it's, uh, it's uh, 
you know, quite simple to use. Now, if I just give you guys the link in the chat uh, in case you want to follow along, um, there's that. So let's say that we want to change something very specific about the legend. We know that it's it's not really documented that well in the original R documentation, but we want to be very specific about it. So if I just expand the legend, the legend bit, um, I can see that there's an argument for show, which varies between true and false because it is a Boolean. So we've already used that, that's fine. Um, but it goes to see some, there's some other ones like item style, item style, uh, Obviously, it it relates to, so let me make the legend appear once again. So I don't saw basically refers to how these like kind of legend icons look like, right? So if we're, we want to be very specific about how it looks for some reason, that we could go to I don't saw, we can see that we can change the colors of this. We can change the border color, the width. Um, like there might be some shadows underneath it that we can change that. We can change the opacity which is like the transparency of the icon. So all of these little things. So let's say that we actually want to change the, okay, let's say we do want to change the, the transparency. So yeah, so opacity, which is what we're currently on. Um, we know that we just opened the item style, right? So we know that opacity is an argument within item style. And we know that item style is an argument within legend. So what this then translates to in our code is within the legend function, we open up item style argument, we open up a list, and then we specify the opacity argument. And then within opacity, uh, it says it supports a value from zero to one. So let's say we set the opacity to 0 0.5. And after I run that, you can see that it's gone a little bit transparent. It looks a little bit light. So we know that it's worked. So this is just a quick example to show you how we can translate this uh, JavaScript according to the, this documentation here into our language. And we can see that it's worked fine because um, the, the people who made this R package did a good job of kind of translating uh, um, the, the R language into JavaScript. All we need to do as the users of this package is to uh, know what arguments exist and are possible. There are very few cases where I have tried some arguments and they did not work in the R version, but those are very rare cases. And I imagine they're kind of exceptions to the case. I think most of the time, whenever I do this, it just works in R. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Cool. So now uh, if you're curious about all the arguments within like a certain geometric type, like E bar or E line, they will all be under the uh, series group. So if you if you scroll down a little bit until you see series, you'll and if you expand that, you'll see there's a bunch of different geometries. And then just expand line, and then you'll once again see all of the arguments available to you, all the customization that you can do in your plot, changing the line layout, the item styles, blur, uh, all these things. Cool, any questions about that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so then I then go on uh, in the slides with an example of changing the uh, line color of a line plot. Um, but it, yeah, I essentially followed the same process that I did before. So uh, this code actually should have been uh, using a different data set, but it makes no difference because the functionality that I showcase is the same. Okay, so we don't need to go through exercise two for the sake of time, I think. Um, so I can just kind of do this as a live example of the, the functionalities. 
uh, kind of bring it all together. So let's say we want to make an SPC chart, which is essentially a line plot uh, showing the count of male mental health patients in treatment over time. We want to add an additional line for the mean. We want to add two additional lines for the upper and lower control limits. And then we want to set the tooltip as axis. And then for bonus points, uh, we are increasing the symbol size of one of the layers. Uh, and then we are changing some specific colors uh, of the lower and upper control limit layers. So I will just uh, do that and you are free to follow along. So I'll just skip directly to exercise two. Okay, so this is the MH data set. Let me open it up just to remind myself of what the variables are called. We're doing MH, we're piping it into each charts. Oh, first we need to filter to a uh, the male group. So we're doing a filter, group equals male. And then E charts. Uh, X axis is usually date. Right, so the variable is called date, capitalized D. And then essentially an SPC chart is a line chart first and foremost. So we're doing an E line and then we are plotting the value column. I'm just going to run that, see how it looks. Pretty good. And then an SPC chart will always have a uh, mean a mean line, so we have that in the data set. And then we also add on two more line layers. So I would say the only con of the e-charts package is that you do need to like maybe be a little bit more repetitive with the function calls. But I mean, in Plotly, you probably have to do the same thing anyway. So I don't, I don't think it's a huge uh, con to be honest. So let's see, upper CI, lower CI, upper CI, E line, lower CI, and see how that looks. Right. Yes, and this doesn't look that good because it's got the markers on top. So we want for these two last ones, we want symbol to be none. So that's the argument here. Yeah, so now you see this remove those. I need to remove it for the mean as well. Yep, so that looks like pretty standard SPC chart. Um, what other additions do we want? We want we want the the values that reach to have a bigger symbol size. Right. So I think that's because in my data set that I've uh, prepared beforehand, I've highlighted the values that are uh, larger than normal, just for example's sake, I think. So theoretically, if I just plot the value breach values and make them stand out, that will do what I want. So I'm going to add an E scatter layer using the value breach column and as stated before on the slide, I will set the symbol size to 15, which is bigger than, than usual. After I run that, you'll see that uh, these symbols that are either close to the uh, control limits or have gone over the control limits have been highlighted with a bigger data point marker right behind it. That's kind of just to bring bring some awareness to these particular data points, even though it doesn't really make sense because there's some that are breaching and they're not. Um, that's purely because the data set that I, that I use isn't cleaned that particularly well. But for the same example, you can see what it's doing. And then we also want to change the, the mean and the control limit lines because we don't really want them to be different colors, right? We just want them to be the same color. So to do that, um, I will refer to JavaScript documentation. Let me just skip to the very beginning. So we're here, um, we expand on series. We know that it's a line that we're working with. So we expand on line. 
And then I know that I just, uh, I, I want to modify the color. So I am looking for something related to color. And I think that line style is probably what I'm looking for. So I'm expanding on line style. And then I see that there is a color argument. So that seems to be what I'm looking for. So it's line style, color, okay. So then theoretically, if I do line style equals list, and then color equals um, blues or something. Let's see if that works. Okay, that looks like it's worked. Uh, the, the main line is definitely blue now. So I'm just going to copy and paste this argument to the other layers that I want have the same look. And now they look quite consistent. Now, if I were to be really nitpicky, I would want the opacity to be lower, so transparency, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we can do that in our own time, right? Um, oh, I think that should cover most of what I wanted to do here. Yes. Uh, yeah, the example that I show here is uh, much more appealing because I chose better colors. But I think you can see uh, what I am going for. In my opinion, eCharts syntax is simpler, um, but there is a charm to the Plotly syntax as well. So I love both packages. I do not. I'm, I do not have a bias. If you were to ask me which package to use, Plotly or eCharts, um, I would tell you that it depends on what plot you're making because there are certain strengths and weaknesses in both packages. So let's go through those plots. Uh, uh, let's go through those strengths and weaknesses. So I'm sure you might be wondering what they might be. So I think if you, the immediate thing that I would say, if you were to ask for eCharts' uh, strengths, is that eCharts is really good if you want a custom theme and you want that custom theme for several charts. So at least in my workplace, we have kind of a, an organizational palette so we have a default set of colors that are colorblind friendly, that are kind of uh, um, following our brand colors. So we tend to use that palette whenever we can for the reports that we make and for the dashboards that we make. So what we've done uh, using eCharts is we've made a custom theme for us and we try to use that custom theme for all of our parts that really helps kind of like generalize the branding of all the products that we make. If that is something that you care about, then eCharts is, um, might be better than Plotly because in Plotly it's like, oh, you do have to specify it every time in a way. Unless you're a JavaScript genius and you can kind of um, create your own script and, and refer to that every time in a project. But I have no experience doing that. I just know that eCharts does this very well. The other strength that eCharts has, I would say, is, sorry, wrong slide. There we go. So another strength to eCharts, I would say, is connecting plot reactivity. So what that means is if you've got like two plots that are related to each other, kind of like a faceted plot. So let's say that you're, uh, you create, you have a plot for each geography or for each uh, sex or for each demographic group, ethnicity group, et cetera. And you put them all in the same report or dashboard. And every time the user hovers over a certain point on one of the plots, the same uh, information will also be presented for all the other plots. And if you kind of deselect a uh, menu item on one of the plots, it will also deselect for the other plots. So. In a minute, I'll just, I'll show you how that looks. But if those are features that you think would be helpful to uh, what you're trying to do, then I would suggest that you try out eCharts instead of Plotly because Plotly doesn't really do that. Um, I think we've already highlighted Plotly strengths. Plotly can do buttons, it can do drop down menus. Um, eCharts can't really do that. So you can't really modify your data set based off of a button that the user has clicked on. So if that is something that you need for your plot, then go with Plotly. 
The other strength I would say that I will probably mention later is that Plotly is generally more popular. So um, more people would have gone through issues and errors. So if you're going through an error in Plotly, you're more likely to find a solution to it. Whereas if you're using eCharts, you might be less likely to find a person who's um, able to help you because they don't have that kind of experience with eCharts. Cool, so uh, let's go into some examples of themes in eCharts. So I will send a link to this uh, nifty theme builder that eCharts has. So I will just send this into chat. And in here, you can make your own theme. So this tool is pretty basic, uh, simple to use. I think you just click on the uh, theme colors and just select different colors until you're happy with it. If you've got specific hues, obviously you could just copy and paste it into this field here. But you know, I'm just gonna select some stuff at random. And if, you know, this is what you're happy with. So you can also change the colors of the text. You can make the border a, a little bit thicker. Um, there's just some specific things that you can do for line charts, like smoothing the line, which uh, I don't tend to do, but some people might like that. You can also change the line width so that it's either thicker or thinner. I believe it does accept decimal points. So if I do that, it should accept 1.5 and anything in between. Um, item size, if you want the data points to be bigger or smaller, you can do that as well. You can also change the shape of the data point as well. So all these things that you can customize, and if you know JavaScript yourself, you can probably customize it even further, uh, depending on how much, how far you want to go. But I feel that this basic uh, tool is enough for me. So once you're happy with how your theme looks like, you just click on the download button here. And then you can download this, uh, JSON file. So you can either do the JS version or a JSON version. I tended to go with the JSON version. Um, I just download this file and then I just upload it into my project. And then I can refer to that theme every single plot that I do. So then they're, they're all consistent. Um, I have pre-prepared a custom theme uh, in the course materials so that you guys don't need to do that. So we can we can we can see how that works right now. So let me choose a previous plot that we've made. Maybe this one. Or okay, I'm just gonna go with this one, but without like all the line style stuff because I want the colors to be completely controlled by the theme. I run that. Yeah, so that yeah, so this is a very basic line plot with the mean, right? Okay, let me copy and paste this code into the chat so that it's um, easy for you guys that are following along. So I'm just using this very basic plot and all I'm doing is I'm doing a pipe and then e theme. And then with this e theme, you're just going to reference the name of the JSON object to download it from the theme builder. So I pre-saved a theme called custom.json. Um, you might have noticed this file at first. So uh, it just looks like this. Completely in JavaScript, it just specifies all the um, default kind of theme values. You can probably imagine you can do all this in your R code, but why would you? Like this is just too much. So you're sa so you know you're saving it as a JSON file. That's why. And within eTheme, you just say custom .json and oh sorry, it should be eTheme custom. If I run that, you'll notice that it looks significantly different from before. Uh, that's because it's successfully using the the theme that I pre-made for for this course. So you know, it I just kind of used NHS colors and played around with the the line thickness a little bit just to show you that it's possible. But yes, that's how you do it. So 
all I do whenever I do a project and use the organizational theme, I just have this JSON file with me at all times, upload it to every project that needs it, and then I just call this every time. And then it's you know consistent. I find that quite useful. Um, there are also some pre-made themes that eCharts has. So by Google, those themes. You can also have a look through them if you just find one that you like, you can use one of them. So this is the page that I am looking at. So it's got some preset themes made ready. Um, you can have a look through, see if you like any of these, if you do like any of these. So let's say, for example, um, Westeros looks different. So Westeros, I think I feel like it's a Game of Thrones reference, this one. Uh, so because I like Game of Thrones, I guess I will use that for my example. The theme custom and, oh no. We don't need to do e theme custom this time because the preset theme is just e theme and then the name of the theme, which is restaurants. And you can see that theme has changed. So, yeah, um, one of HR strengths themes. Now, um, the other one that I showcase is the connectivity between two graphs. So, what we can do is we can make two graphs, one for male patients and one for female patients. So I am just going to copy this code again without the theme bit, probably. Or actually with the theme bit, it doesn't matter. We're just connecting two pods, right? So just gonna, just gonna do this. Uh, so this one is gonna be for male. I'm gonna save this as plot one. And then plot two will be essentially the same plot, but for females. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna run that. So now you have two plots and then you can connect them using the function e arrange. Um, actually, I think I need to use e group. Step. Yes. So if you wanna connect two plots, you kind of have to connect them in a way. So you need to specify E group and they have to have the same group ID. So I'm just gonna specify NH for plot one and then same ID NH for plot two. It needs to be the same if they have if they can connect to each other. And then uh, at some point you need to specify E connect group, and then you specify the connecting uh, ID and H, and then you can use E arrange plot one, plot two. And if I run that, it will plot these two. And if I, let's say I deselect mean, you'll see that it's deselected it for the second plot as well. So it'd be probably better if I had specified the tooltip. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly add that in. Both plots, rerun, and then rerun e arrange. And then now, whenever you hover over one plot, the tooltip for the other plot will also appear. So you, you can imagine if you've got a lot of plots, so like a faceting situation for several geographies, this might be useful, especially if you've got several layers. So right now we only have two layers, but say you have like several layers and it's a grouped faceted bar plot or something like that, um, it might be it might be useful for the user um, to not you know, do the same thing for the other plots. Uh, I think this is usually used for, for dashboarding situations. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a way to make them side by side as well. Let me just double check. Right, it's called calls. I specify calls equals two. They're next to each other. Okay, that is much better. Let's you see the result much more clearly.
Okay. Any questions about e charts? I realized that was a lot of information all at once. Okay, no questions. It's great. Um, I mean, um, whenever there's no questions, I just assume that everything was clearly explained. So, uh, okay. So I think that's most of what I was going to showcase with the interactive plots. Um, obviously there's a lot more functionalities available that you can go to the, um, the documentation and look at, you know, each of these packages have their respective sites, uh, which I do link in the slides. So, I'll put them in the chat for you. So this one is eCharts. And this one is Plotly. And each of those websites have a lot more examples of what the, uh, the, plot, the plotting packages can do. So it's got more than line charts and bar plots. It's got, uh, you know, like, really cool ones like where's a sliders is one that I didn't manage to cover um, because we didn't have time for it but you can control the plot using sliders uh, so this is very so you could use these for dates um, over time you can also animate a, a plot lay graph using uh, using this as well there's a there's a specific page uh, on this website for animations like that. So it's quite cool if you're doing modeling and you kind of want to see how the, uh, you know, admissions or something go up over time um, as a GIF or a video or something. Yeah, much more examples here. And obviously the same thing goes for the eCharts page. You've got examples of all sorts of chart types including network charts, which are quite uh, impressive. Uh, I find that most people are really, really impressed by kind of network graphs, which you can do. But there's also um, designated packages specifically for making network graphs. So you don't need to stick with uh, any of these. You can, you can have um, a look around yourself, maybe do some research on, on what is the best package to use. So I will end the session by summarizing kind of the, the key points of each package uh, and then leaving you with just a bunch of links and resources to go through on your own time. So just to summarize for Plotly, Plotly is more popular. Again, this means that people have more experience with it. If you have an issue, you will probably find someone on Stack Overflow who has an answer for you, hopefully. I would say that Plotly generally has more functionality. Just if you go to the two websites, you can see the difference of examples of functionality. So you can probably get the sense that Plotly does have more functionality, um, but there are certain functionalities that I find that eCharts does better. Um, Plotly has the uh, immense strength in that you can add buttons and drop down menus in a plot, which um, if you can't, uh, host a Shiny app on the server. If your data is confidential, you can't make a Shiny app. You have to make an R Markdown document that you email across to people. Then, uh, you know, Plotly is for you because you can add that kind of drop down selection functionality to the actual plot. And Plotly works with Crosstalk, if you're familiar with Crosstalk, which adds even more filtering capability capabilities. Um, certain structures like error bars, if you work with confidence intervals or error bars a lot, Plotly is much better. I did not get to showcase that, but it is essentially uh, eCharts errors quite, um, quite a lot if you try to use error bars, so I would not recommend using eCharts with error bars. Uh, eCharts, pros, simple syntax, easier to learn and pick up, easy connection between subplots, uh, very easy to customize themes with eCharts. In my opinion, aesthetics-wise, eCharts is slightly better over Plotly, um, but obviously that is subjective and up to you to decide.
Uh, the exercise three is essentially just to put the plots that you've made into an R markdown, knit that and see how it looks. Spoiler alert, it does not look any different. Um, it will just it will just be interactive as usual. So that's just kind of to prove to you that it works within our markdown document and it works within a shiny app as well if you work with shiny apps. So we don't need to go through that. I'm sure that you all believe me that it works. And then last few slides, as I said, just a bunch of links. So I've also included some links to other interactive plotting packages, such as Leaflet, uh, Crosstalk, which I mentioned, Viz Network, and some other ones that um, you may or may not be familiar with. They're all interactive plotting packages of different sorts. Leaflet is probably uh, the most popular one from the bunch because everybody uses Leaflet, uh, Leaflet if they're making a, a map, an interactive map. Uh, Crosstalk is very popular because you can kind of combine widgets together. So you'll see what I mean. If you do visit the help page for Crosstalk, you'll see what I mean. It just adds that ex extra la layer of interactivity if you do use Crosstalk. Um, but obviously, these are stuff that you can explore on your own time after you fully understood how to uh, create interactive plots in the first place. Uh, which I think that we've all achieved today, honestly. Um, and uh, this network is specifically for making network graphs, same for network C3. And then you got Shiny, which, you know, um, is Shiny. And you got this slide on resources. So I think that everybody should have access to these slides. Um, the slides are in your course material folder. So it's this PowerPoint file here. Um, and then if you've downloaded it from the GitHub, it's the same thing. It's just this PowerPoint slide. So you can look through that on your own time. But um, any final questions before we end the training session. Um, I feel like, um, I don't know if I went through things too fast, but um, I, I really appreciate those of you who have been asking questions, interacting in the chat because um, it is like, um, uh, it, it does, it is quite tiring just listening to myself talk all the time. Oh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay, well, um, hopefully, you know, the code that you've done today would be helpful to you for your future projects, for your work. Um, I think my email is in the slides. Let me, oh, maybe it's not. I'm kind of surprised. Okay, well, um, I'll leave my email in the chat in case you want to email me about um, anything regarding the course or uh, any uh, any of the packages that we went through today. Happy to receive emails from people. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending this course um, and, and participating in chat. I really appreciate it. Um, hope you'll have a great lunch and rest of your day.